So, so this is, this is a, an aspect, uh, an attribute. This is something that, that Jesus is to be known by, right? That, that, that the, the whole entire government of the world rests upon his shoulders. His strength is unmatched. He's unbelievable. He can do anything. Nothing is too hard for him. And yet there are things that we face in life where we start to struggle to believe that he's going to come through for us or that he can. Well, this is just this is just impossible. There's just this is just no there's just no way. Because then what happens over time is um, cancer becomes pretty mighty. All of a sudden, over time, you know, relationship challenges become mighty. Financial challenges become mighty. Job problems become mighty. And what has happened is we have taken a name that is reserved for God, and we've given it to something else. And I I'm not here to like bash us over the head and make us feel bad for doing that because we all f- kind of fall into that at times. We all struggle with that at times. But I'm here today to encourage you to, to, to remove uh, the, the, the mighty name you have given to some things in your life and to give it back to God. Can you believe it? Just over a week away, we are celebrating Christmas. Uh, Lindsay and I were out last night uh, or yesterday afternoon doing some last minute shopping. And uh, let me be honest with you, I could go the rest of my life without ever doing that again. Uh, it, it is that time of year. It's just nuts out there. So, uh, but we are in full Christmas mode. How many of y'all have a, uh, a Christmas tradition in your family that you would, you would call like, like sacred? It's like non negotiable, has to happen every year. Anybody got some Christmas traditions? In your family, all right, you don't have to be, yeah, there you go, thanks for participating, okay? Um, I was thinking about that this week, you know, one of my favorite uh, traditions growing up in our family uh, was that uh, every year uh, our, our family would uh, anonymously adopt uh, a family who was in need, uh, who'd, who'd gone through some hard times, down on their luck, whatever the case, and uh, my parents would bring us together. I remember my brother and I. We'd get we get to like throw a name in the in the in the hat. Basically, uh, there were some families that we knew of at school who were struggling, or there's some people in church uh, or whatever people we heard about. And uh, our family would sort of figure out who we wanted to help this Christmas season. And we'd we'd get this uh, gift basket. We'd fill it with gift cards and maybe some food we th- we thought they would like. And you know, we'd, uh, we'd put like a turkey or a ham in it. And I remember uh, our parents would uh, drive us over to the neighborhood of wherever these people lived. And, uh, you know, dad would shut the headlights off. We'd start kind of creeping down the street a little bit. Uh, and then the side door of the minivan would, would open up and my brother and I would jump out, you know, and, and we'd carry this gift basket up to the door. We'd be on the doorstep. It's late at night. Everybody's asleep. And uh, my brother and I would just start knocking on the door as loud as we could, ringing the doorbell, and then we would sprint, like, <laughs> as fast as we could, you know. Uh, and my parents taught us how to ding-dong ditch. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so, but we would, we would sprint, like, away, like, jump over a bush and hide behind it or a tree and hide behind a corner. My parents would be down the street a little bit. I think one year they even had binoculars and their lights are off, and we're all looking, waiting to see these people open their door, you know, and... Uh, uh, waiting to see the reactions on their faces. And I remember time and time again, the, just the, the, the shock, the surprise, the, the emotion, the tears running down their faces. One year we adopted a family where the, the, the dad had, uh, had, had suddenly passed away and it was just their first Christmas and without, without him. And uh, it was just, you could see the emotions, right? And I remember those, those moments, those traditions, being a part of that, um, really marking several Christmas experiences throughout my childhood. It was one of those reminders that, that Christmas is, is not about us, right? That Christmas is this opportunity to, to help people experience the love of Jesus wherever they are at in life. And so I was reading the Christmas story this week. It's something I like to do um, every Christmas season, right? Just kind of ponder on the details, kind of remember how impossible this story really is, how unlikely the story really is that it ever happened this way. It's, it's unbelievable. It's mind-boggling. And I was reading through it, and I began to notice all the reactions. I began to notice, like, the shock. I began to, to notice just the, uh, the, the, the emotion in, involved in, in people's reactions to the angels or to the prophecies, to, the, to, to, to this child being born. And it reminded me of this tradition growing up, you know, in my parents' house, this thing we do every year. And I 
uh, I, I stopped and I, and I just thought about it over and over again, and, and, and it hit me that the reactions I'm, I, I saw back then growing up, they absolutely pale in comparison to the reactions we read about in Luke and Matthew, right, about the Christmas story. And what's amazing, what's amazing about what I saw as a kid and what we see in this story about Jesus' birth is all of this surprise, all of these like unexpected details, all of these things that like, it seems like everybody is shocked except God, right? Like nobody anticipated it. In fact, if you and I were writing this story, like if God gave us an assignment, hey, hey, figure out a good story, a good way for my son to be born and how this would play out, we would have not included the shepherds, the lowest of lows, right? We wouldn't have had shepherds at the bedside of the king who was just born, right? We wouldn't have picked an unmarried teenage girl to be the mother of Jesus. We wouldn't have picked a stable or, or like a manger, you know, for, for the king of the universe to be born in. And yet God did, and, and as random as all that sounds, and as unexpected as all that sounds, as shocking and surprising as all that sounds, when you zoom out to like a thousand foot view, and you begin to understand how God saw all of this unfolding, you realize he wasn't shocked at all, he wasn't surprised at all. In fact, all of this unfolded the way he had planned. We read about all of these prophecies in the Old Testament that tell about the birth of Jesus, that it's going to happen someday. You read about all of these ancient prophets like Isaiah, like Hosea, uh, Micah, you know, prophesies about Jesus' birth, Zephaniah. What's interesting about Micah, he actually prophesies that Jesus, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. You know how impossible, like, that prophecy was? Did you know that Jesus' parents were not from Bethlehem? They were from Nazareth, right? They were not from there. They didn't live there. They, it, it just so happened for God to pull this prophecy off that was given hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, that Jesus had to be born at just the right time in history for, for the, the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, to want there to be uh, a census of the entire Roman world, requiring everybody to travel back to their hometown, meaning that Mary and Joseph would have to travel to Bethlehem. And you, you know how, I mean, the, the details of this, and, and not just that time in history, but she would have to be pregnant at this time, and not just pregnant, she would have to be near birth. I mean, if Jesus would have been born like a week prior or a week later, this prophecy about the Messiah would have not been fulfilled through Jesus' birth, and yet it happens, and it is so unlikely. How many of y'all like the game uh, pool? Anybody have a pool table at your house like to shoot some pool? Anybody? Yeah, I see some of you. Uh, I, I, I was going to make a joke about a a pool bar, but uh, I, I, I guess I'll just, anyway, I didn't, I did, it wasn't coming to me. But, uh, you know, you like to play pool. Well, like, these Old Testament prophecies about Jesus' birth is basically God going eight ball corner pocket. This is basically what it is, right? This is him calling out his shot. All so that you and I don't think that he accidentally bank shotted it in, into the hole, right? It, it wasn't like this random event that just somehow happened it's so that we would understand that the call and the shot that God took, uh, it, was, it was calculated and it was intentional and it was impossible. I mean, like, this shot that God took, that he said he was going to do, it's the equivalent of him saying, you know, off the wall, you know, off the mini fridge, hit the antlers that are hanging on the wall, side pocket, you know? And as impossible as that is and, and could never happen, we realize that it did happen. And that God did everything he said he was going to do for this child to be born. Well, one of those impossible shots that God took is, uh, is found in Isaiah 9-6. It's the foundation verse, the theme verse of our Christmas series. And it says this. It says, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Everybody say it with me. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. So Isaiah 9, 6 is basically the birth announcement of Jesus. Okay? And, and yet what's interesting about this birth announcement is that it's not announcing a birth that has actually happened. It is announcing a future birth that will happen in about 700 years. Could you imagine getting a birth announcement like that in the mail? Could you imagine getting a birth announcement? You know, you go out to your mailbox, you, you pull out this envelope, you open it up, and your friends are telling you about, you know, their future child that will be born in five years. They're not even pregnant yet, you know, and you're like, this is, this is pretty strange. 
This is what's going on here. This is the, the birth announcement of Jesus. Now, what's even more bizarre about this is the content. Like, it, 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 it's so detailed in its description of about what he will be like. Could you imagine getting a birth announcement that, that said, you know, like, wonderful counselor, mighty God, born December 25th, you know, eight pounds, two ounces, 23 inches long, our little Christmas miracle. Could you imagine the, I mean, there's so detailed and descriptive, and it's not, I mean, this would be enough, this would be intense, this would be enough description for a birth that had actually happened, but for a birth that had, had not happened and won't happen for 700 years, it's pretty amazing, it's astonishing. And so when we look at scripture and we see Old Testament prophecies about Jesus' birth from 2,000 years ago fulfilled, it builds our faith. It should build our faith. When we look and we see that God actually did the things that he said he was going to do, it should increase our faith. It should, it should build our faith. And so 700 years, right, 700 years before the Messiah was born, Isaiah, he gives us a glimpse into the future. He tells the people of Israel Right here, he tells the people of Israel that the Messiah is going to be born as a human, but that he was going to be more than a human. That, that, that he would be the physical embodiment of God himself. Right? That he would be the mighty God. And so what I want us to do today is I want us just to look at this prophetic name that's given to Jesus in Isaiah 9-6. We looked at him as a wonderful counselor last week, and today we're going to look at what does it mean to, for him to really be uh, our mighty God. How many of y'all have ever met somebody who's just ridiculously strong? Anybody? You ever known somebody just ridiculously strong? I, um, uh, I assume you didn't think of me uh, uh, just right off the bat there, but I, I appreciate it if, if you did. Um, years ago, I, played, I used to play a lot of basketball. I remember when we were living in Spokane, uh, I played a lot of... Uh, you know, I played a lot of pickup basketball in, in, in uh, uh, Spokane. I played, played a lot of kind of kind of high high level, uh, you know, uh, intense leagues uh, there. And I remember playing often against guys who played for the Gonzaga University or Washington State University. And I remember one time playing against a guy who was a starting running back for Washington State. And uh, this guy this guy was chiseled. He was just all muscle. And, you know, I thought that I was a decent basketball player, and, and so I remember trying to get around him, and uh, he was so fast, like so fast. Like I had never played against, this is like a Division I athlete who's just muscle, and I, I, I tried to get around him, and I remember one time uh, in the game trying to get around him, and I lowered my shoulder a little bit, tried to give myself some separation, and I hit a brick wall. I mean, I, it was a, I mean he, there was no moving him off his spot whatsoever. Uh, in fact, the game was so physical that I had, to, uh, I had to go get adjusted at a chiropractor later on that week. It was like so physical, right? Um, Isaiah talks about Jesus coming as, as mighty God, and he says that when Jesus comes, he's going to be pretty strong. So strong, in fact, that, that the entire government will rest upon his shoulders. The entire authority, governing authority in the earth, is going to rest upon him, that he's going to be pretty strong. And so I looked at this, this word, and I tried to break it down like I did last week with Wonderful Counselor, and I wanted to know, what does this really mean? What is, what is Isaiah really saying when he calls out the Messiah as, as mighty God? Well, the word mighty comes from a Hebrew word, and, and this Hebrew word is uh, gabor. It means mighty, champion, hero. And obviously, the word that stood out to me here when I, when I thought about this was was champion, and I, and I realized that Isaiah is prophesying to us 700 years before Jesus comes that he's going to come and be our champion God. All right, I mean, think about the beautiful picture here in Isaiah's prophecy, because when you think about a champion, a champion is the one who is the last person standing when a conflict is over. And this is, a, this is such a beautiful picture that Isaiah gives us in this prophecy that this child that's going to come, he's going to be our champion. There's such prophetic imagery, such prophetic uh, language used here that, that we see uh, that Jesus is our champion who conquered sin and death, right? who, who destroyed the works of the devil and, and forever remains the last one standing. I mean, it's just amazing to think about this, that, that Jesus is our champion God, that he has overcome it all. He has conquered it all. He remains the last one standing. Look at Colossians 2 with me. Uh, it says this, Paul says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. 
And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. How many of y'all know that Jesus is our champion? He's our champion God. And it's, it's just amazing to, to see this and to look at this. And I think one of the, the things, one of the questions that, that kind of popped up in my mind as I was preparing this message for you was, was um, kind of this, this, this confusion in how so many people struggle to, to believe that God is as strong as he says he is. And I just wondered this thought, why is it so hard to believe that God is mighty? Why, why is it when we, when we read in Scripture, we hear about all these stories, we hear that he's our champion God, we know that he's disarmed you know, um, Satan and, and all those powers, and he's defeated them once and for all, and we know that he's pretty big, we, we get all this, you know, and, and yet in the practical walkout of our daily life, it seems to me as a pastor, I talk to more and more people who struggle to actually believe that God's as big as he says he is, that he really can do the impossible, that he really can do anything, right? And, and, and it, it seems like more and more I, I noticed people who are struggling uh, with this concept, and they don't actually say it. They don't actually say, well, he's not very mighty, or he's, he's not very strong, but in the practical walkout, their, their, their life is living out in such a way that they're, they're actually removing the mightiness of God. They're, 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 they're not believing that he can do uh, everything. And oftentimes it's because we're facing some pretty big things. I mean, that's really, that's really what it is, right? We face some pretty big things. Big things. They, they, they seem uh, pretty mighty. Uh, if you've ever faced some, some, some financial problems, some money problems that fe- feel pretty mighty, you know, you ever face some job challenges or some relationship challenges, marriage struggles, whatever the case, and, and, and we, we see all these things as pretty big, pretty mighty. I love what Jeremiah says uh, in J- Jeremiah 32. 17, he says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for God. Let that just sink in here for a second. Let that sink in for a second that nothing is too hard for God. I don't know what, you know, the story looks like in your life today. I don't know what the headline news is, I don't know what the challenges are that you're facing, but I want you to be encouraged in your soul right now that nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for him. And, and think about this verse that Jeremiah gives us. It's such encouragement, but I want you to see like the context and how he wrote it. Because 15 verses prior to this, Jeremiah 32, verse 2, this is what, this is what it says. It says, Jerusalem was then under siege from the Babylonian army, and Jeremiah was imprisoned in the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace. Look at where Jeremiah is. You ever just met some people who had, they seem to have great faith, but then you look at their life and it seems like everything's going well for them? Like, you know, I want people, I want to, I want to be around people who have great faith when things aren't going well for them. When, when things aren't going the way that, that they thought it would or they thought it should or maybe, maybe they feel disappointed or a prayer doesn't get answered at the, at the exact way or the exact time they thought it would. You look at Jeremiah's life right here and he encourages all of us that nothing is too hard for God while he is sitting in prison, while Jerusalem is under siege from the wicked pagan Babylonian army, King Nebuchadnezzar's army is about to, to conquer Jerusalem and he's saying this to us that nothing is too hard for God. He still recognizes in that moment. I want you to know, like, in a moment like that, where, where it seems like the worst is about to happen, uh, it, is, it is common for many of us to, like, lose our faith or for our faith to shrink down uh, to something very, very manageable. And Jeremiah, in that moment, gives us an example of, of someone who still has great faith, even in a very difficult circumstance. So I don't know what brought you to church today. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what life looks like. Uh, but maybe you came here today and there's something in your life that's hard. There's something in your life that is difficult. Maybe your marriage is a mess. Let me just encourage you right now, wherever you are at in life, that nothing is too hard for God. Maybe you, you lost your job recently or, or, or your business, whatever, is taking on water. It's, 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 uh, it's not going the way you want it to and you don't know where to turn. No matter how bad it looks, I want you to hear me today that nothing is too hard for God. Maybe the doctor's giving you some information that, that you wish he wouldn't have given you. Maybe there, uh, there's an illness or 
something that's terminal, there's something going on in your body, I want to tell you today, look at me, make eye contact with me if you need to, that nothing, 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 nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing's too hard for him. He is the mighty God. He is all-powerful. He is, he is almighty. We struggle with this, though. And so I just gave you all this truth, right? I just gave you all this truth to sort of just sort of try to unsee any lies we've started to believe or we've believed for a while. Because we do struggle with this. Because we face some big things that, 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 that cause us to wonder if God's even there, if he's even able and so if you take a note, so why don't you write this thought down? It's kind of a, a big thought for the day. Um, it says this, in our struggle to believe that, that nothing is too hard for God often becomes the breeding ground for fear and doubt. Our struggle, like our struggle to believe that, 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 that God can do anything, that nothing's too hard for him, becomes this place in our life for fear and doubt to begin to grow, uh, for them to have a voice in fact, let me just say this to you. I, I would say that, that fear and doubt are the very things that will reduce Jesus down to a place where he seems incapable. It does it all the time. Like fear and doubt does this all the time in our lives. Like whatever the case, if you're a person who likes to be in control and you've ever found yourself sort of manhandling the plans, fear and doubt will always look to reduce Jesus down to a place where he seems incapable and, and, and uh, it, it makes us feel like we, we have to rely upon ourselves. This is, what, this is how it works all the time. If you're taking notes, look at this with me. Fear and doubt, with fear and doubt, we remove the mightiness of God and we give it to something else. So, so this is, this is a, an aspect, a, an attribute. This is something that, that Jesus is to be known by, right? That, that, that the, the whole entire government of the world rests upon his shoulders. His strength is unmatched. He's unbelievable. He can do anything. Nothing is too hard for him, and yet there are things that we face in life where we start to struggle to believe that he's going to come through for us or that he can. Well, this is just, this is just impossible. There's just, this is just no, there's just no way. And what happens is over time, we don't even realize this is happening. We actually strip or remove the mightiness of God away from him so that we don't even experience that part of who he is. And we actually give it to something else. We give it away to something else. I don't know if you've ever done this in your life, um, but, you know, we say this all the time. We're like, you know, I'm going through something pretty big right now, something, something pretty big. Or we talk about other people's problems, and we say, you know, so-and-so is going through something pretty big and pretty mighty right now, you know, and we, we kind of frame it in, 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 those, in those words. And what happens over time is um, cancer becomes pretty mighty. All of a sudden, over time, you know, relationship challenges become mighty, financial challenges become mighty, job problems become mighty, and what has happened is we have taken a name that is reserved for God, and we've given it to something else. And I, I'm not here to, like, bash us over the head and make us feel bad for doing that, because we all f kind of fall into that at times. We all struggle with that at times, but I'm here today to encourage you to, to, to remove uh, the, the, the mighty name you have given to some things in your life and to give it back to God. Begin to experience that aspect of who he is, maybe all over again. And so I guess I would just ask, you know, what are the things in your life right now that you would call mighty? What are the things in your life that could be described this way? Let me show you a story in Mark chapter 4 where the disciples faced something pretty mighty. It says in verse 35, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Verse 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, look at this. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a, a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? 
The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. It's a really incredible story where we see uh, a mighty God calm a pretty mighty storm. How many of y'all know that in this story that there was a mighty God on display? I love a lot of things about this story. A lot of things I would just pull out and that bless me in the story, but maybe the thing that blesses me the most is that Jesus is fast asleep in the midst of a major storm. How many of y'all have ever gone through a major storm in your life? How many of y'all have gone through something significant, something difficult, a challenge, and it has seemed to you as if God was fast asleep? You ever felt that way? You ever been like, where are you? Anytime you want to wake up. Anytime you want to get involved, I'll I'll, I'll gladly allow your intervention. Um, And we find that he's fast asleep in the midst of a major storm. Anybody ever ever know somebody who was just a hard sleeper? You know somebody who just could sleep through anything, right? It's like you're you're literally shaking them and they do not wake up. You know, you want to just slap them in the face and they don't wake up, you know? Um, whatever, Whatever the case. But let me, let me just give you this, in this story, let me help you out here. Jesus isn't like a hard sleeper. Jesus isn't sleeping through the storm because he's like a hard sleeper, a guy who can sleep through anything. The reason Jesus can sleep through anything is because Jesus is never nervous. You understand? Like, like, like this, is, this is what's going on. You may, it may seem to you as if Jesus is asleep. It may seem to you as if he's not involved in your life. It may feel as if, as if he has left you alone or he's abandoned you in certain situations of your life. Let me just, let me just tell you, it, it, it is not that he is uninvolved in your life. It's, it's that he's just not nervous. He's not caught off guard. He's not shocked. He's not like, oh, man, what am I going to do now? You notice he wakes up. He's not freaking out like, oh, man, we're going to die. He simply looks at the challenge and he rebukes it, tells the, the, the wind and the waters to be still. Let me just tell you, this story um, is, is so different to me after being in Israel earlier this year and being on the Sea of Galilee and actually looking at the water and feeling the wind in my face and knowing that it was these waters and this wind that obeyed the, the voice of Jesus. Unbelievable, unbelievable experience. And so the reason Jesus can sleep through anything is because he's never nervous. So, so what does that mean for us? It means that whatever storms that Jesus is sleeping through are storms that I am invited to sleep through as well. Whatever storms it looks like, I mean, he is just not nervous, he's relaxed, he's sleeping through. Do you know that he invites you into that same rest? Do you know that he invites you and I to that same place? To that same place where we can just be with him, where we can trust that he's got a solution, that he's got a plan. And I guess as I look at this, this whole like, overarching thought of why, why I, I think we struggle to believe that God is as strong as he says he is or as mighty as he says he is, there are, are, are some things I've noticed over the years as a pastor I want to give to you quick. One of the things I've noticed uh, as a pastor is that oftentimes the most significant storm that Jesus needs to calm is not the one that exists around you but the one that exists inside you. I've, I mean, a hundred times I've seen this. I mean, you get people who come to me and they're like, like, this is what's going on. These are my circumstances. I've, you know, I need a job or I need money or I need a miracle or my body this or my, my, my kids this or whatever the case and my faith is. And, and every single time, I mean, I mean, like so many times, I realize that the storm that God wants to calm in their life, the prayer he wants to answer is, is not the, the, the storm that exists around them, these external circumstances, but it's the one that exists inside them. It's the turmoil, it's the fear, it's the doubt, it's the lack of confidence, it's the struggle to believe that he's going to come through. He wants to calm that storm in your life wherever you are at today, let me just tell you. And I just believe that I came here today to encourage you with this, that maybe there's some things you've been struggling with in, in, in truly believing that he, he is in, in control, that he's got a plan, that he's got good thoughts for your situation and I, I just believe he wants to speak to the storm that exists inside of you, and he wants to say, be still, calm down, peace. And he wants us to get to a place where we, just, we, we really believe this, that even though this isn't what I would have planned, even though this isn't, this isn't what I would have, have written, uh, I, I still trust, I still believe that his plan is better than my plan. 
Do you know how hard it is to get to that place? You know how difficult it is? I mean, yeah, I, I could just tell you story after story after story of things I've gone through in life where, where I just have to, I have to resolve myself to the fact that, okay, like, like I wouldn't have planned this. I'm not even saying like he planned this. But I'm, saying, like, he, I'm not saying this is his fault even. I'm just saying like I, I am trusting that in this moment, I really believe that what he has up his sleeve, the, the thoughts that he has about this situation are, are, are better than, than mine. Better than mine. Corey Tin Boom says this. She says, look at the world. You'll be distressed. Look within. You'll be depressed. Look at Christ. You'll be at, you'll be at rest. Other reasons why I think we struggle here uh, with believing he's so mighty or so strong or strong enough. I don't think we just completely remove his strength. We just, we just reduce it. We reduce it down to a size that's manageable. I think it's because a lot of people are more impressed by the size of their problem than they are by the size of their God. Again, I mean, not, not, to, not to shame any of us. I, I've done this a hundred times. I look at the challenges I'm facing and I'm, I'm like more impressed at how big the mountain is. How, I, I'm more impressed at how impossible the situation is. I'm more blown away by all of those aspects of what I am walking through and instead of being blown away by how big my God is. And let me just tell you, mountains that you face in life, challenges you face in life, doctor's reports you face in life, whatever the case is, they serve as giant mountains that want to reduce your faith and, and, and that want to, that want to uh, uh, you know, bring fear and doubt into your life and cause you to remove the mightiness of God and give it to all these other things. I want to tell you today that if you would be someone who's more impressed by the size of your God than by the size of your problems, I believe that faith will build in you today. I believe that faith will rise in you today. That, that you, you will walk out of here today believing differently about the things that you're facing right now. We have to, we have to come to a place where we see him for who he really is and we believe that, that, uh, that he's as big as he says he is. Look at what Craig Rochelle says. He says this, what you fear the most reveals where you trust God the least. Is that interesting? It's an interesting thought. Like what, what would serve as like the greatest fear of your life? What would be? I mean, I talk to people all the time and they'll say things, you know, like, like finances or their family, you know, or, you know, kids, whatever, whatever it is. And I mean, what is it? What, what is it that serves as the greatest fear in your life? And it's just, it's just this example. It's this revealer of where you may struggle to trust God, where you may struggle to believe him for, uh, for breakthrough. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's, uh, it's money. Maybe it's, it's a number of things. Family relationships. But what you fear the most often reveals where you trust God the least. Let me give you one more thing I've noticed as a pastor and why people, I think, struggle with the strength of God, the mightiness of God. I, I think it's because what you believe will determine how you behave. And, and, um, and this is what, what I mean by that is we know this to be true. So if you believe something is right, it, it, it affects how you behave, right? You'll do something because you believe it's right. If you believe something is wrong, it affects how you behave because you won't do it. You'll stay away from it, right? Most of the time. Some of you, some of you. Uh, you know, uh, but you know, like, like that's, that's how it, it plays out in our life. Like what you believe uh, determines how you will behave. Well, this affects faith and unbelief as well. So when I have like faith in God, when, I, when my faith is big, it affects the walk out of my life. It affects how I behave. It affects how I live. Where there is doubt and unbelief and struggle and all these things, like it affects it as well. I, 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 don't, I don't stay very connected to God. I, I, I take matters into my own hands. I'm in, in freak out mode and crisis, inner turmoil, all these things. And, uh, and, and it's a direct result of how, of how I have decided to believe about this situation. And some of us, like, like to be honest with you, like, like the thing you need from God right now isn't an answer to prayer. It's a renewed mind. You, you, don't, you, don't even, you don't even need an answer to prayer right yet. That's not even like issue number one. We need God to renew our mind so that our faith will increase and we'll begin to see him for who he really is. 
not as like a monster God who doesn't answer prayer and puts us through difficult things, but as a loving God who actually cares about what we're going through, has been tempted in every way just as we are, who's without sin, that this is the God that we can approach and come near to and have relationship with. Some of us just need a renewed mind to begin to see him that way all over again. So I want, I want more than anything like for the people in our church to experience a mighty God. Like I, I want you to experience his greatness. I want you to experience how enormously amazing your God is. And so there's reasons why we don't, though. There's, I think that there are, if I were to like diagnose it, I guess. If I were to diagnose, I mean, these are some things I hear people basically deal with that I've given you. But if I were to sort of diagnose the issue, um, I, I, I think, I think it, it comes from a place in Scripture. Let me, let me just share this with you. Um, the problem and the solution for, for uh, why, why we think this way and how we, how we can begin to experience God um, in a different way again. Matthew 17. I'm going to invite the worship team up. Matthew 17 says this. It says, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Look at verse 17. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Now, this is a pretty, pretty mighty God dealing, dealing with a pretty big situation, right? And what we find here is that there are, there are some situations like this that, that the disciples have actually been able to handle that there is some mighty power that has been given to them uh, in other cases where they've actually been able to uh, deliver people from demons. They've been able to heal people. And they come to this situation and, and they expect a mighty God to do something mighty and it doesn't happen. And, and they're confused by it. And this is what Jesus says to them. Because Jesus is basically telling them that like, you should have been able to do this. Like, this, th like you have authority that's different than the authority that, that Satan carries. And he, so he says to them, he, he says, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. Now, he is speaking to his disciples, okay? Because then he, he says, how long shall I stay with you? Because he understands that he's not gonna be with them forever, right? He says, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. And Jesus begins to sort of diagnose the problem of, of why Even though they want to see something mighty happen, it's not happening. And he, he, he points out these two big words. Jesus tells them that you're an unbelieving and perverse generation. Well, look at unbelieving with me. What he's basically getting at is he's telling them that, that, that you are, uh, you're not connected to God. If you're an unbelieving generation. If there's fear and doubt, if there's struggle to believe, He's saying there, there is a part of you that's not connected to God like it needs to be. And he's even saying this to his disciples. There is a connectedness to God that is missing here. And I, I just want to tell you that, that if there are some things in your life you're believing for, contending for, pleading for, things you want to see God do, we need to see God do, things we're desperate to see happen, sometimes, not all times, okay, sometimes, some of the reasons behind why breakthrough doesn't take place has to do with us not being connected to God like we need to be. But he doesn't just stop there, right? He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Well, perverse, what he's getting at is saying you're too connected to the world. And so when breakthrough doesn't happen, like in this story, and sometimes in our life, there's, there's these two reasons, these, these symptoms. Sometimes it's because we're, we're not connected enough to God and we're too connected to the world. Not connected to God and too connected to the world. You ever see this happen in your life where you just get too connected to things? You're too connected. You're, you're, you're thinking too much through, like we talked last week, like a secular worldview. You're thinking too much like the world thinks. Your values and priorities are, 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 are tainted too much like the world. And Jesus is looking at his disciples and he's saying, look, you're an unbelieving and perverse generation. You're not connected to God and you're too connected to the world. 
if you're taking notes, look at this thought. These things limit my ability to, ability to experience a mighty God at work in my life. Unbelief, perversion, which is just a twisting of the truth, right? They, they limit my ability to experience a mighty God. The story goes on, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful it does. In verse 19, it says this. It says, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private <laughs> and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? Talking about this demon. Jesus replied, Because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 21 says, But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus gives them this, this concept, this idea that, that some of the breakthrough they're looking for, some of the manifestation of the mightiness of God in their life that they're pleading for, interceding for, asking for, can only come through prayer and fasting. That it's the solution to it. Because here, here's why, look what prayer does. Prayer, prayer connects us to God. You, you know this, right? You see this happen. Have you ever felt distant from God and you just come into prayer? You begin to have an extended season of, of, uh, of real, real like devoted prayer life with him and, and, and this this connection begins to form differently. It's stronger. You feel connected to God all over again. Prayer connects us to God. And so Jesus is giving the solution to the problem because he's telling them, he's saying, he's saying, okay, you are an unbelieving generation. It means you're disconnected from God. You want to know how to get breakthrough? You got to get connected to God again in prayer. But then he doesn't leave it there. He says prayer and fasting because fasting, this is what it does. It disconnects us from the world absolutely disconnects us from the world. There is nothing about fasting that makes sense in the natural. Where you take a season or a time of not eating, where you take time of, of, of not enjoying like certain, certain entertainment or certain things that are normally not sinful or problematic, but, but you're, you're, you're uh, saying no to your flesh and no to your desire, the desires of your flesh so that you can focus on God, so that you can get connected to God and disconnected from the world. I, I, just, I just really believe that, that Jesus gives us this, this prescription for some of the problems we might be facing in life. This isn't, this isn't, I'm not telling you that every unanswered prayer is because you haven't been praying and fasting. But what I believe is that there is a spiritual discipline here that we hardly talk about in the church anymore. And a lot of people are faithful to pray. And so they're coming to God and they're, they're, they're trying to get connected to God, but they're still too connected to some other things. And, and, and it's affecting their, 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 their prayer life. It's affecting their relationship with God. Look at this thought with me. Prayer and fasting, these things prepare us to witness a mighty God, do mighty things in us, and ultimately through us. They, 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 prepare, they prepare the ground. They, they get us ready. They... They, uh, they prepare us to experience God do mighty things and bring breakthrough into our lives. And so I say all of that to try to, to try to introduce you to something I really believe God is calling our church to. And so in the month of January, for the first, uh, from January 2nd through the 22nd, I'm calling our church to a 21 days of prayer and fasting. Really believing that this is something that, that uh, um, is being spiritually led that it's not just um, uh, you know, an event or a program that we're wanting to put on. I really have felt for months that God wanted us as a church to do this. He wanted us to have a time of prayer and fasting. And so I am uh, asking the church, I've asked our leaders um, to join um, with me in this. And uh, there is some resources I'm gonna be giving out next week and in, in, in the week after to help prepare us for this. Um, there's gonna be some prayer focuses each day I want us praying on. Um, in terms of fasting, there's a lot of ways to do this and, and it's a personal decision between you and the Lord for 21 days. 
I, I want you to begin to think about what are some things that, that uh, um, areas of your life where you want to see the mightiness of God at work. What are some things you need to contend for? In terms of our church, what are some things that we need to begin to contend for in our community? What are some things we need to contend for for our future, for our children? What are some things we want to see happen? And so for 21 days, Monday through Friday, we're going to have a prayer meeting here every day from uh, over lunch from noon to one. Not everybody can make it. Some of you can. Some of you, some of you might be able to actually work your schedule a few times so you can get there a few times during 21, 21 days. Every Saturday morning, it's like three Saturdays, we'll have a prayer meeting from 8 a.m. Till, till 9 a.m. here at the church. And then Sunday mornings during that time, we're going to come together. There's not going to be an actual prayer meeting that day. It's going to be church, and we're going to rock this place and lift high the name of Jesus. And there's a principle of priority that's all throughout Scripture, cover to cover. This principle of priority that he gets, he gets, gets first place. And so this is, there is something very spiritual about us as a church coming together and saying, saying our first days of the year, we're setting aside and we're giving them to God. And we're putting our ear to the ground. We're asking him, what are you saying to us? What are the things you want to you push on in our lives? What are some things... Uh, that you want to do in, in, in uh, incredible ways. And uh, I, I believe that this is going to be uh, a, a very incredible um, season for our church. And I just, I, I invite you to participate uh, in this um, and to do something. Like, think about this. What if everybody in our church, like, did something? I realize not everybody could do, like, a complete fast. I'm not asking for that. But what if every single one of us could, like, give up something and that thing that we're giving up, we replaced it with prayer? And we began to just focus on God like intentionally for three weeks. Like, like, what could happen? What could begin to happen in your life? What could begin to happen in this church? I think a lot of things. A lot of things. And so you're invited to be on that journey with us. And I, I've told our leaders, I said, I said, even if I'm the only one here over, over the lunch period for 21 days, I'm going to be here. This is a big deal to me. And this is something that I want our church to begin to be marked and known for as a church of prayer. We're not good enough. Let me just tell you something. I'm not talented enough. I'm not a good enough preacher. Pastor Josh, all of us who are trying to lead this church, we're not good enough, talented enough in our own to try to take this church where it needs to go. We need God, and we need to hear from him. Amen? Would you stand with me? Because of Christmas 2,000 years ago, because of the incarnation of God, the Word becoming flesh, we can know Him as our mighty God. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 3. He says, now to Him who is able. I just want to tell you, some of you right now, that is a big word for you today. And this is maybe a scripture that needs to, needs to be a scripture you pray. Now to him who is able. You start your prayers normally out. Sometimes you say Father God or, or Heavenly Father. I encourage some of you with fear and doubt are things that exist in you. I want you to start your prayers by saying now to him who is able. I want you to get that language in your vocabulary and you begin to, to speak to him. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine Listen, according to his power that is at work, where? Within us. Within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him who is able, there is nothing that he cannot do. Nothing. Would you just bow your heads with me for a moment here? I want to just pray. I want to invite, Holy Spirit, would you just begin to, to work powerfully in every person in this room right now under the sound of my voice. Holy Spirit, would you begin to just, to just put your round, arms around every person who's dealing with, with some fear, every person who's, who's, who's struggling with doubt, every person who has seen one too many unanswered prayers and they're struggling to hang on. I ask for deep encouragement into their soul right now. Lord, we lift our eyes unto the hills, like David says. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Father, we turn our eyes to you right now. God, I ask for every person in here who's dealing with some of this, this struggle deep inside, and it's not just a, a one-time thing, but it's been, 
It's been months or years of struggling in this area. I just speak to their spirit man right now and say, lift your eyes. I speak to the spirit man that looks defeated, that, that, that seems just, uh, just down for the count, and I ask right now, lift your eyes onto the hills. Lift your eyes. Turn your head, turn your gaze, turn your attention upon him. Consume your focus with Jesus. Father, just bring such encouragement, such encouragement to this place right now. Every stupid scheme of the enemy, every dumb lie, man, every opportunity where he's been able to get his foot in the door, we shut those doors right now. Not anymore. God, I pray for the voice of truth to just ring loud in this place right now. Such a big God. Such a mighty God we serve. Nothing is too hard for him. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.